So just a little bit about me. Obviously, my name is Toby. Um, I'm a cultural producer and I work across predominantly theatre, um, festival kind of spaces and film. Um, and I'm really interested in sort of multidisciplinary work, work that challenges how we use traditional art spaces traditional art spaces um, and work that centers very specific communities uh, in my context that is usually black and brown communities and working class communities um, and the intersection of the two um, and yeah I, I guess as a I'm primarily a producer so I haven't necessarily created my own work so I'm really interested in people that kind of do both and are both artists and producers and that sort of relationship, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, <laughs> wicked. So I've got, um, I guess, a breakdown of different things that I want to talk about and I'll sort of just tell you the headlines and the bullet points um, and then we'll kind of go into each section in a bit more depth. Um, so the first one is about resourcing self-initiated projects. So projects that I've, I've either started myself or hasn't necessarily been like commissioned by an organisation and just sort of the politics around that. Um, juggling multiple projects, um, approaching partners, building a presence um, in terms of your own kind of personal brand, I guess you would say, for lack of a better word, um, and a post-COVID sector. Um, like I said, I really want these discussions to be super fluid. Um, I will post the headlines in the chat as well, so you can kind of see what we're talking about. Um, but feel free to unmute and ask questions and respectfully interrogate ideas and um, all of that kind of jazz. Um, I guess as a preface as well, like I love that we're all sort of geographically spread all over the gaff um, in this conversation. It's really exciting and I feel like it's really important to sort of say that obviously there are nuances in the different areas that we live in. Um, the context that I'm going to be speaking about is um, the context that I've worked in, which is um, it, I've, I grew up in South London and I've predominantly worked in South London. Um, so that is sort of the specific context I'll be talking in. I can't talk for the rest of London, I'm not going to lie, Northwest and the kind of man, I don't know what they're up to, but <laughs> South London has <laughs> my home, um, I can talk about, but obviously that might not translate to all the different areas that everyone else might live in. So um, that's something that I want us all to bear in mind while we move forward with the conversation as well. Um, awesome. So self-initiated projects um so there are several things that i want us to think about and talk about here and um in terms of just how we do that and i guess it's a mix of some of it will be quite practical things in terms of how you fundraise for these kind of things and all that kind of stuff but i think there's also stuff around that as well in terms of people power and time and like managing our own personal time um and if you're initiating a project that's alongside like a job job like what that looks like and feels like um in the conversations that we're having about funding at the moment obviously i'm going to be talking about funding in like a pre-covid <laughs> a pre-covid world and what that looked like before and hopefully how we can sort of reimagine what those funding avenues might look like um Again, later we will talk about post-COVID and what that might mean for the sector. Um, so when it comes to sort of pre-initiating projects, um, I guess the main project that I will talk about in my experience is um, my company called Black Ticket Project, um, which um, is an initiative that sort of creates cultural access points for black young people, um, primarily in London, but also starting to be across England and hopefully further as well. Um, and that project was initially, um, I, I consider it a community project. So it exists because of people, people make it run, people make it, make it work. I think if your project is focused on very specific communities, um, then there's a conversation that can be had with your funding avenues for those projects and the way that projects are funded, are funded especially by kind of public funders um and the sort of legwork that comes with that in terms of evaluation and all those kind of things that you need to think about 
at the moment, Black Ticket Project is funded um, through a Patreon, which we set up, which is where people can donate to us monthly. Um, and that sort of allows me to dictate on what tiers lots of different people are able to access the work that we're doing. Um, I'm signed up to Amara's patron and it's good, so you should all sign up too if you haven't already. Um, <laughs> but it's something that I think allows the person a bit more freedom um, to sort of talk, say and talk about the things that they want to do. Um, but it also builds a, a community hub of people that are directly supporting um, that um initiative or that person or that project that doesn't mean that you're no longer accountable to anyone i'm accountable to my patrons i need to keep them updated on what's going on and um, they could easily pull away their money as, as quickly as they could set up and put it in so these are things to sort of know and um, and i guess that feeds into time and how we utilize our time and make sure that we actually have the space to to do that um and at the beginning um it was funded by crowdfunders so just kind of putting out crowdfunders for very specific things. And I'll kind of talk specifically about that process um, in a second. The main reason I haven't gone to public funders yet, um, and again, it kind of comes into how we sort of reimagine how things are funded, um, is because of the process that a lot of public funders go through when it comes to evaluation um, and the sort of, qualitative and quantitative data and the metrics that people ask for and whether that aligned with the ethos of my work um so i'm sure all of you will know that public funding comes with a lot of tip boxes a lot of hoops you've got to roll through a lot of fire you've got to go over just to get that small small check check in the in the post um and i don't really want to do that to be honest and i think it's important to consider that i think public funding is sort of the first thing that we throw ourselves to when it's like okay god i've got an idea i need to fund it this is how i'm going to do it but i think there are still ethics and morals involved with any kind of money and the people that you are accountable to um in my case i didn't want to have to justify to whoever the public body um why black kids should see theater I just didn't understand a way for that to be justified in a sort of evaluation process. Um, I didn't I, I didn't want to go through the whole sort of it changed their lives by da 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 that it wasn't information I was trying to pull from them. And actually my relationship with the young people that I work with is is more hands-off and more of a bridge contact between organizations that are already working with black young people and the organizations that I want to get them into rather than me being like the pie piper and they all live in my house that's not the relationship i have with them so it wouldn't necessarily work in that kind of way um and also understanding the people that i was working with so we're talking about kind of youth groups youth organizations youth workers who are already inundated and probably under resourced already i didn't want to add an extra element of paperwork on their backs where they've got fill out like they've got to make 20 kids fill out all these evaluation forms and such and such um so that's the way that's why i kind of stayed away from the process of public funding um because i just didn't feel like that process of having to justify why i do the work that i do necessarily fitted in with a lot of public funders and there are some that are much more hands-off and i guess that more comes down to private funding in terms of trust and foundations that in itself is political but again i'll come on to that in a second um so if you are going to go to a funding body it's really important to find the one that is the right fit for your project don't just sort of throw yourself into sort of okay yeah i'll go to the arts council or i'll go to hlf or i'll go to whoever because they give people money usually it's still really important that the process of funding works for you and your timeline and your organization. And I think it's okay to sort of test lots of different methods of funding as well. And um, our Patreon for me was a test and it was just sort of like, if it works, then cool. And we'll kind of keep going and see where that goes. And if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll figure something else out. So everything is still a test at the moment. Um, and in that time, I have applied for like the Douche Bank, um, Deutsche Bank Creative Fund and stuff like that. 
as well along alongside it but that was sort of like two years in when I had a better idea of what exactly I wanted to do with the organization as well so it wasn't I didn't sort of set up the project and be like cool this is like my three-year plan and this is what I want to do it was like this is what I want to do this month and this is what's going to happen and then in a couple of months this is going to happen and eventually it's led me to get to a place to say okay actually in the next year this is what I'd like to achieve and maybe in the next two years this is what I'd like to achieve um and I think that just comes down to being very realistic with your time as well um for me I felt very pressured that I had to like achieve a million things and make it like the biggest thing ever um, and it was like actually that's not how my life is working I don't work on that ticket project full-time because I can't at the moment so I do have several jobs <laughs> in my freelance work alongside that project um so if you are someone that is freelancing or at least working in multiple places um being really honest with the time that you can commit to your side projects or your whatever your baby um is really important not just for the growth of your organization but for your own personal growth as well and your own mental health and your own self-care and putting in parameters that make sense to you that don't necessarily need to make sense to other people but something else that I found that was really important was people power in terms of resource that's where a lot of my resource lay it was sort of like okay cool I could get funding to do things but I still can't do this all by myself the politics of that is that I didn't want anyone else to do things for me for free because I was already doing things for free and I wanted to pay people how do I pay people with no funding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even though people did offer and sort of volunteer bits of their time and, and stuff like that, um, that it's a very sort of personal thing in terms of what works for you. But I think if you can find a way to make it work and there are very clear boundaries and clear parameters in how you're working with people, if people want to volunteer their time to help you, I think that's fine. Like I said, like Black Ticket Project is very much a community project. Like it doesn't work without the community. I can't, I can't do it on my own and I don't ever want to do it on my own. Um, that's not to say everyone should work for free forever. No, we're not going to do that. Um, but equally, I've had people sit down with me and say, um, okay, you want to register it as a community in this company. I'll help you look at that because that's their expertise and it's not mine in the same way that you would find the gaps to fill in knowledge in any other job it's the same for your own organization as well you don't want to get caught up in all these loopholes because it's like oh shit i actually didn't know anything about this and i just kind of tried to go through it um and people are really giving do you know what i mean people are really lovely there's been plenty of times where i've reached out to amara for a conversation um and being the babe that she is she's just been like yeah cool let's have a chat stuff like that I just think we need to do more of um so but again find the boundaries in terms of how that is going to work exactly um even if it's your mates especially if it's your mates to be honest like <laughs> make sure that there are very very clear boundaries and structures and how you're going to work on it together if both of you are at the at the time doing it for free um trust and foundations are interesting places <laughs> um so i'm probably preaching to the choir here but for anyone who's who doesn't really know custom foundations are essentially like generational wealth old money and um, they're usually sort of families that have funds and essentially want to dictate how they spend those funds um so a lot of trust trust and foundations will have like a, a family name um and most of the time people from that family will sit on the board of wherever that trust and foundation is um with trust and foundations i guess a, a sort of positive with them is that they are very specific about what they fund so when you're going into public funding it's sort of like you can maybe get funding for anything and it kind of depends on the way that you frame it all that kind of stuff whereas a trust and foundation might be like we don't fund stuff like that and that's kind of it and you can be like okay boom let me move on and go somewhere else um but it is relationship building it takes a long time to sort of build those relationships because it's personal and it's their money and they can kind of do what they want with it they're not really 
liable to the public to sort of explain where that money is going and you know they don't really care about making it diverse and all of that kind of shit because they're not really liable in that sort of way so a lot of it is kind of relationship building and those relationships can take a very long time to build depending on how much money you're asking for it could be like a year plus do you know what I mean it's a lot of lotion in basically um <laughs> just to try and get to know some rich people but it'd be like that sometimes um and so with trust and foundations a lot of that will usually be like in person meetings kind of going in and chatting to them they'll ask you questions about your projects um or the kind of ideas that you want to do they might interrogate some of that and again like that's where the politics comes into it whether you want to whether you want to compromise on certain things to gain the funding or whether you want to challenge them on things um i had to meet with garfield weston um for quite a lot of money and they the guy on the board who was part of the family was like i don't know i feel like we're lacking a lot of like oxbridge artistic directors nowadays like is this really still a problem and i was like yeah what do you mean <laughs> what do you mean it's like those are those, like those are some of the people that you might come up against and how you navigate that conversation um is is really important that doesn't mean that you need to sort of fault um and be like yeah no it's not yeah we need more Oxford people of course like, i totally agree with you mate like realistically i'm not going to say that in a meeting but again how you sort of switch it back to the way that you're working in your project and say well yeah that's true you know over the last couple of years we've had this many artistic directors come into post in lots of buildings but actually we're missing a, there's a gap when it comes to the executive level and that's the area that i want to reach or there's a gap when it comes to this like just find your very kind of specific area and bring it back to your project without trying to get into the politics of why what they said was trash um because that's that's also emotional labor that no one needs to do basically um so just keep it focused um i'm speaking very fast so let me slow down hopefully i'm not speaking too fast um when it comes to just to go quickly into funding applications and i guess trevor what you were saying about the world at the moment and the sec the way that the sector has always been but also the challenges that also come with writing applications um and a lot of that being a language barrier to be honest um in terms of the way in terms of funding speech fundraising is something everyone needs to be interested in you don't need to like it because i personally find it really boring <laughs> but it's something that i think everyone should be familiar with and it's a skill, a sort of basic skill that most people should have. Um, and that can sort, that I guess varies on lots of levels, whether that's like knowing how to write on the application through to being able to like memorize who runs Garfield Weston, who runs Esme Ferber, who runs the Arts Council and being able to wheel off those names. I can't do that personally. I'm still not in that, I'm not in that level, but um, a, a funding class that I did with David Jubb, who used to run back to the Arts Centre, he was literally just like, I can tell you who all these people are just by looking at their face. That's a very extreme skill. <laughs> and everyone kind of looks the same. So it's also a bit difficult to do. Um, but it's something that everyone should be interested in. Um, there are lots of ways that you can sort of, anything that I do is I always look back at other people's applications that are applying for similar things to me. I'll always read other people's applications um you can obviously ask people directly some people like people that i don't know have asked me to read applications and I'll, i happily send it to them there's no reason for me not to obviously admit your personal information but the application itself a lot of people will be willing to share um so definitely just reach out to people and ask um a lot of places will have a freedom of interest in place so you can kind of go to organizations like the art council and say can I read an application about blah, blah, blah? They will most likely share that with you. Um, so study it, basically study it. There are lots of different angles you can go in when it comes to funding, more specifically with public funding. Um, not so much trust and foundations, but I'll kind of switch to that in a bit. Um, with public funding, sometimes it's not always about the art, which, 
I know hurts <laughs> to hear, but sometimes I don't care about your project because sometimes your project is so similar to a project someone else is doing. It's like, cool, I want to make this really immersive theatre show about grime um, and it's going to have a backdrop of a council estate. Okay, cool. What else? <laughs> there are other things that you can, you can channel your funding applications into. Sometimes it's about you as an individual and why this is important for you to do. Not necessarily about what you're doing, but if it's your first application, for example, why receiving that pot of funding will help further your career because you haven't had that financial support before. Um, why you as a very specific, why you as an individual should be leading that project. So yes, it might be similar to something else, but the, the team that we're working on it wasn't your team. And that's really important. Um, sometimes it's about leveling up. So sort of saying, well, actually I've done all of this stuff already and this is going to take it to the next level. Sometimes the, you won't really write about the art that much. Unless the art is very, very specific to a very particular theme or a very kind of specific angle that doesn't get told much. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind as well when sort of writing this thing. Sometimes people don't care that you're making a piece of work, which sounds really shitty, but it's the truth. Um, if you're any public funding that you're applying to, so not just Arts Council, but National Lottery anywhere, Chat to them before you submit your application, please, for the love of God. Don't go in dry because you don't need to. <laughs> Even though there are so many loopholes, their job at the end of the day is to give away money. Not give away money, give people money. You know what I mean? That's their job. That's what they get paid to do. Even though it, yeah, it feels like there are so many, you know, traps and like secret alleyways and stuff like that, but their job is to give people money. Talk to them first, always. No matter how many applications I've done, I will always chat to them first and say, this is a project I want to do. Can I have a conversation about it? And that will help just sort of minimize a lot of the antagonizing that you'll do over, is this correct? Is this the angle that I should be applying to? Sometimes they'll just tell you the angle that you need to go and they'll just be like, don't say that because that's not interesting. Say this instead, change that number, put in this. You need to mention something like this. Um, it just helps so much, minimize a lot of that stress that comes with just trying to guess when you've got like a thousand other people trying to apply for the same pot of fun. Always talk to them first. That can be over the phone. It can be an in-person meeting. It can just be emails. It kind of depends on what works for you. And I think... If you're someone that also struggles with writing applications, um, these options can also help with that process as well. So if it's easier for you to meet someone in person and just talk your idea through with someone, then opt for that with them. Record yourself while you're having that conversation. Anything that just makes your life easier in terms of filling out that application, do it, but always speak to them first before you put something else in. With trust and foundations, you'll kind of do that anyway. Um, and then I guess another arm of that is about kind of like patronage and like trying to find rich people to independently support projects. I have not reached that level of life, so I don't know how to help. <laughs> I don't know how to help with that specific area. I really don't. Um, but you, you don't know who you're like two degrees away from. Juggling multiple projects. Um, I'm a freelancer. Um, yes, I am a freelancer. Um, <laughs> and being able to juggle multiple projects, I guess part of it is a blessing and like, great, I have multiple projects in the first place to juggle <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But also how do you prevent burnout how do you how do you make sure that you're delivering all of your projects to the best standard that you can um a lot of this probably ties in with the first thing that we talked about but something else that I guess I wanted to to talk about and hopefully for all of us to share are just tools and systems that we use to manage ourselves because essentially that's what we are, we're doing we're managing our time we're managing our headspace we're managing our capacity um I'm going to talk about some of the tools and systems that I use, but I'd really love it if other people could also share some of the other things that they do. Um, I will say this really depends on the kind of learner you are. I will say like what works best for you. I'm very much like a sort of visual 
person so I love my color coded post-it notes all of that jazz I don't do things well with sort of like it being written down unless I'm making like a list and then the list has to be in very particular colors I love my excel spreadsheets <laughs> so working out whatever works best for you and just test test everything and see what sticks um it's probably the most important thing before you even try and commit to any sort of tool and systems there's some that I look at and I'm just like this doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> um, and nothing's gonna work um so so yeah figuring out the way that you learn and how your brain operates when it comes to wanting to make a system for yourself um for me has been really important um working out your cash flow as well um kind of fuse back into how you manage multiple projects how you know what to say yes and no to and when to take things on um if i'm working on two year long projects and they both come in at, at the same time that's great because it means in a year i might get lots of money but what am i doing in the meantime how am i paying my rent and my bills how am i eating and living and traveling and taking care of myself um so a lot of the time is also negotiate if you can negotiating with whoever you're doing that work with or for when you get paid for that work because that will help you then manage how you spend your time juggling all of those projects knowing which days you're going to work on things for what length of time um and when that money is going to fall in your bank account to sustain you through that project um because there's no point sort of taking on lots of things if you can't survive in the meantime um saying no to things is really hard um i think especially if you're someone that has been racially marginalized or economically marginalized it feels like you've got to say yes to everything because the opportunity is it going to come around again um and i still struggle to do that i've said yes to things i probably shouldn't should have said no to at the time and you can only you can only account for that in retrospect but i think in inhabiting that agency to sort of turn work down and stick into it is really important um and and only you can really i guess my so my friend coco brown has a really great system um which also helps with imposter syndrome called what gives me the right um and it's a list that she writes where she has a question about something um, so it could be like she's been offered a job or something and she'll say, okay, what gives me the right? And she'll kind of write a list of the pros and cons of that piece of work. Um, and then she'll read back that list and obviously be very honest and open. You're only accountable to yourself. No one else is going to read it. Um, and she looks at that list and that's when she's like, do you know what? I could just not do this. <laughs> it feels like it's going to be a lot of work and actually I'm not fully invested in it, even though it's with the National Theatre or whatever um another time she'll be like actually this is a project i'm really interested in or this is an artist i'm really interested in and i really want to further that relationship so being really open and honest with yourself and weighing up the pros and cons of a piece of work when you've been offered it even if it's with a big ass organization they're going to come back to you like they will come back around i know everyone says that and sometimes it's like but what if they don't but they will more time they will um and you can also have that conversation with them. If you don't want to kind of say no to something straight away, then just go into negotiation first and see if there's any space to sort of shift things and move things and make it more flexible for you. Um, if you don't want to completely lock it off, but if it's not possible, do not do it. The burnout is not worth it. The, the lack of mental capacity isn't worth it, especially if you're not going to deliver a project to its fullest potential um, or, the, or to the best of your ability. Um, so for me, I like to sort of plan a bit in advance and I kind of use key marks in the year for my planning. So for me, like my year begins in September because my brain is still in like secondary school. So my, my, <laughs> my year starts in September. Um, so that's like my measuring tool, September to September. And then another part of my brain looks at the financial year as well because of tax and stuff. 
<laughs> I just got a shudder when I said that. Um, <laughs> so I'll look at that period of time as well. But I also look at things like my birthday, which is in June, so it's right in the middle of the year, and Christmas, which is obviously at the end of the year, knowing that Christmas and January are the two driest and hardest months ever. So having to work around that and make sure that I've got enough around that time. Just look at those key moments in the year for you. Um, I know in March, March is hella expensive because it's my brother's birthday and my mum's birthday and my parents' anniversary and Mother's Day. And my mum is going to want different gifts for all of those things. So <laughs> silly, silly things like that that no one else needs to know about. It's how I sort of work around my time or work around my year to make sure that I know, okay, cool. If I'm doing a bunch of projects, I need to have more money than usual at this point. Um, and at this point and in these other moments, I'll be fine with this, this, this and this. Um, and I'll all, always negotiate how much I want to work with an organisation or what my time looks like. If an organisation is coming to you as, um, as a freelancer, then there should be room for negotiation. Like, they're not employing you. You're not on the, the PAYE where you've got to work X, Y, Z amount. If they're saying, okay, we need to, you to work a certain number of hours, how you negotiate those hours is kind of... Is, it's down for you to have that conversation with them. What works for me personally is I will work a maximum of four days a week. Um, because I don't like working five days a week. I feel like my brain just shuts down, especially on a Monday. A Monday isn't my day. So I kind of lock off that day and say, nothing can happen on a Monday because nothing's going to get done. But Tuesday to Friday is where I want to open up my time. And so I might spend one day a week on a very particular project or half a day on a very particular project and then three days on something else um i never work on the weekends i'm very very strict with i say very that's a lie it's, sometimes it slips i was like i'm very strict i'm not sometimes it slips i'm not gonna lie um <laughs> but i try to be very very strict with my weekends um because that's my personal time and that's when i have time to replenish um and i put that time in my diary um so i set up a i think i've I've put in a repeated day every Sunday until the end of time called Toby Day. Um, and it's just my, it's just a day for me to, to do stuff for myself. And it just means that when I look at my diary and someone's like, oh, could you do something on Sunday, the something, something, I can look at my physical diary and see that the day has been blocked out. Um, if you feel like you're still going to move that, call it something else, call it something really important like a really important meeting that, had, that doesn't have your name in it. Something that just allows you to, to have that in your diary and you can show that and say, oh, actually, I've got this thing blocked out all day on Sunday, so I can't do that, but I can maybe do something else. Whatever your system is of just like holding yourself accountable, just do that. So mine is Toby Day and I put it in my diary and I block it out and it's yellow, yellow coded. And I know that I can't do anything on those days. And if I'm making an exception, I need to know why I'm making that exception. So what are the rules to myself? What are the rules, rules that you're going to set to sort of allow your boundaries to expand if they need to? Your boundaries are really important. Like, don't make anyone feel like they're giving you an opportunity. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I would do that as well and just sort of like, these are my working limits. Um, if anyone's ever emailed me, my email has an automatic out of office that just sort of says, your girl is busy. I'm probably not going to get back to you um, in the next day, but I will try my best to get back to you at this time. In the meantime, here's a whole bunch of other things that you, you can look at. Um, and that has just helped the amount of back and forth of people being like, I'm just chasing you up. I'm just chasing you up. I'm just chasing you up. It kind of states very clearly in my out of office when I'm going to respond to you how much time it might take and what the, what the protocol is if, um, if it's super urgent, this is the email that you need to send or just call me, call my phone. Um, if I haven't gone back to you by a certain time, this is when you can chase it up. Alleviate all the admin, basically. That's going to take up a lot of your time just trying to get back to people. Um, and especially, I guess, with social media, a lot of these boundaries feel really flimsy as well like I've had people like send me an email at like 10 p.m and I make it clear my out of office I work these are the hours that I work 
if you email me past these hours, I'm not going to respond. And nobody should be emailing past these hours, to be fair. But I've had people email at 10 p.m. and then follow it up on Twitter because I'm tweeting and I'm just like, bruv, like, I want to watch Love Island. I don't want to be responding to your work email at 10 p.m. Um, <laughs> so like, have those boundaries for yourself and make those really, really clear um, in your sort of professional online spaces but also in your non-professional online spaces because people like to blur to blur those boundaries approaching partners so i guess this is with this i kind of wanted to talk about i guess um again finances versus ethics um working relationships and good practice joint ethos and quote unquote imposter syndrome but we won't spend too much time on that um so I guess this is off the back of if you have a self-initiated project, but it is something that you would like to approach a venue or an organisation or a company on to partner with you. Um, I guess it also kind of depends whether you're approaching a build, like what you're approaching people for, whether it's a building um, or whether it's like an, an additional company. Either way, some of that would should come with finances. I say it should some people are cheeky um but either one it should come with a level of financial involvement um if i'm approaching a partner to work on something it's because i want to share the quote-unquote risk of the project um and whoever i'm partnering with someone on should be equally invested um in what i'm doing enough to also want to share the quote-unquote risk of whatever could happen um if it's a show or if it's a program or whatever that looks like, um, the, the burden of the possible fallouts shouldn't fall completely on me if I'm partnering with an organisation. Otherwise, you're just getting shit from me for free, basically. That's how I see it. So there needs to be a level of financial investment and there needs to be a level of risk sharing. And those are the two kind of things, the main things that I look for if I'm looking to partner with, with anyone about anything um, as a standard thing. Um, when it comes to knowing who to partner with or you know equally if like a venue or, or an organization has approached you and they've said oh i've seen what you're doing and it looks really good we'd love to partner with you on it um and they're sort of like we've got all of this money you can kind of do whatever you want and it sounds all great and amazing um still important to take stock and sort of say okay actually like what are the gaps in the things that i need beyond finance because finance will always be a thing that We'll have to keep coming to beyond that what are the gaps in the things that i need and being able to list that effectively and properly um because a lot of organizations will just kind of take advantage of the fact that you might be a one person two people band doing it yourself anyway and they can just kind of slap their name on their logo on it and be like yeah yeah we did something as well when they didn't um so this is so for example with um black ticket project we were quote-unquote partnering <laughs> with the national theater on um nine night when it transferred to the west end so what we had done previously if that is that we partnered with the nt um in subsidizing tickets for black young people and so they put in some money and we put in some money and we kind of shared the admin of it and all this kind of stuff and then when it moved to the west end and obviously there were different kind of stipulations with the west end um they were sort of like, yeah, we don't know if we'll, we'll be able to kind of put in money or or like reduce the tickets. So you'd probably just have to buy the tickets at full price and then distribute them that way. And then that's the partnership. And I was like, that's not a partnership. That's me being a customer and buying tickets. Why would you put your name on something and say, oh yeah, like we partnered to send all these black kids to the theater when you haven't done anything other than tell me that the show is happening <laughs> which is stuff that I can find out myself um so it's been very clear and very specific and don't be scared to ask for the things that you want like they'll either say no or they'll say we can't do that but we can do something else or they'll say yes you're not gonna die if someone says no it'll be fine so don't be scared to ask for the things that you want but make sure it's very specific um and if you don't know why you want to partner with them, I guess also like do your research on the people that are, are, are kind of coming, if they're coming to you or if, you, if you're wanting to partner with them. I usually kind of look at their board, if they have one and who sits on their board. Um, I look at 
the if I'm talking in a, a sort of like theatre context, I look at their programming outside of the sort of shows. So um, what does their engagement and quote unquote outreach look like? Um, I look at their, their stock photos as well on their website. I'm not going to lie, if everyone's white, I'm going to be like, hmm, <laughs> where do we go? <laughs> How do we figure that out? So that's like that image is really important as well. Um, so I do a bit of research on things that I want to know specifically. I want to know how invested you are in um, creating diverse routes. I want to know what exactly it is that you want from me as well. Very rarely are people just like, we just want to help you and get nothing out of it. Slung Lo, who I love, are probably the only people that I think would do that. And Alan is just a, a don. Um, but I also am interested to know what they want out of it too. And I will just kind of ask that straight up and say, okay, like from your organization's perspective, what would you gain from this? And sometimes it's just like, it helps with their engagement numbers. And then morally, you can work out for yourself whether that's worth it or not. Um, but my two kind of deal breakers are the financial input and the shared risk slash liability of it. Then anything else I can kind of share the responsibility of. Um, so with Black Ticket Project, admin is something that I ask as well. Because again, I'm doing this alongside all my multiple jobs. So I sort of say, cool, well, if I can collect this information, you will need to be responsible for sending X, Y, Z out to people. You will need to be responsible for them being a point of contact if they need something from the organisation. So something that's not about um, things that are happening before the show, but once they're there, you know, where is it happening? How do they get there? Where do they pick up their tickets? The most I will do is brief them and sort of say, this is what you need to send to people. Because again, if they're not um, used to working with the kind of groups that you want to work with, there might be things that they don't know about or things that just, they just haven't put into practice. How much time you want to spend educating them on that can fall into consultancy. So that's another sort of thing that you need to sort of think about as well in terms of your time. Um, but there have been times where I've had to sort of hold um, briefings with the front of house team and essentially be like, this is how you talk to young people that have never been in your building before. It's a very ridiculous thing to do, but it had to be done for that particular piece of work. Um, if you're looking to find an organization alongside kind of doing your research, I'd also just kind of weigh up why you want to partner with someone. I feel like sometimes it's just like, oh, well, this organization has a, has a bigger name or bigger presence, so we should work with them just because. And sometimes that might, actually not make a difference especially if they're not going to do anything to even like share what you're doing or talk about you like no one's going to know that it's happening apart from the people that you say it's happening with um so be very clear and honest with yourself about why you feel like you need to partner with a company or an organization or another person um and what value that adds to the work that you're doing that the work doesn't already have if they're already doing what you're doing anyway i'd question how much you need them unless it's about people power and you know an organization you utilizing people that might be on payroll to work on your project um out, anything outside of that i would question how much you need them and why um and that will just help you divvy up the list that if you are going into those conversations with them you'll be able to sort of say this is exactly what i need from you um there isn't a sort of like bona fide way to like approach a venue. Like it's not, you know, by chance you get introduced to someone from the Tate and then you go into a long conversation and then blah, 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 blah. A lot of the time it is just reaching out to people and asking again, like if it's going to be in an email, keep it very precise and very specific. Um, if you're not great at explaining things over email, opt for a phone call to kind of give the headlines and then say, I would love to chat to you over the phone about this, or I'd love to meet with you in person about this. But again, that's time that you're spending and traveling somewhere and having to meet with someone and all that kind of just, so do what works best for you. Um, but there isn't like a secret way to, <laughs> to um, meet an organization. If you know people, you can also just ask people to like introduce you to, to the people that you want to connect with. Like I do that all the time and I'm happy to do that for people as well um so you can just sort of say hey I'd love to talk to someone that works in the education department at the national I'll be like cool 
and do that in the introduction from someone that they trust. And I guess that can sort of eliminate the kind of the cold calling of it. Not everyone is going to respond to you, which sucks, but life, <laughs> you know, that is, that is a case. And if, if um, a particular organisation or company doesn't respond, what's your plan B? Are you going to kind of follow up? Are you just going to kind of call their office and try to speak to someone over the phone? Sometimes that's happened as well. And it's just ended up with someone being like, oh yeah, no, I actually did see that email. I did want to respond to it. And I just didn't for life reasons. Um, so it doesn't mean give up completely. But it is a thing where people might not respond to you. Um, what else was I going to say on that? Um, ah, and then, yeah, I also look at, so online, most companies will have a sort of statement that just sort of says, this is who we are and this is what we care about. And I scan that very carefully. Um, I've got a series of buzzwords that for me are red flags. <laughs> and depending on how many times that comes up in their statement slash ethos, um, can really put me off an organization. What um, are they? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, so one of them, I mean, my main one is sort of diversity. That doesn't explain what they mean by that because it just, it's, it's a word that doesn't mean anything to me. What is diversity? Diverse people, what does that mean? Um, giving people a voice. I hate that. Um, I don't get why do they not have their own voices in the first place? Why, and why are you the ones that are giving it to them as well? And if they haven't explained that, then I'm just like, <laughs> to me, that sounds like you're just trying to use people for their stories or exploit them for their stories. And that gets under my skin as well. Um, and this is all in comparison with their stock images on their website as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's talking about diverse and giving people stories. And then it's just like a bunch of white people being like, that kind of scares me. I get little like get out vibes. So I, I just, I'm just like, mm, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> um, so come up with your own buzzwords of things that you look at and you just, things that just make your heart sink or things that you just roll your eyes immediately and you're just like, ugh, like those things when you see them in your everyday are probably your kind of red flag words. Um, and have a look at that in the, in, the organization statement as well because that can help just sort of that for me can be the difference between really wanting to work with someone and being like mm, actually I'm not quite sure um and g-checking organizations doing a little crb check on them I always talk to other people and be like have you worked with this organization before what was your experience what was it like what would they like to work with did you work with this specific person um because that to me, it's just how you get the most insight into how, how it comes to working with other people. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, if you get a bad report from someone, you can sort of decide whether you want to go and work with that organisation again. Um, but it also means that there are things that you can bring up in that negotiation if you do decide you want to work with them. So if someone has said, actually, they're not really good at taking on some of the financial risk or when we work together, um, on the day they said that they were going to provide all of these things like a I don't know production manager and this that and the third and they didn't when it comes into the negotiation and it comes into contracting that's where you sort of bring that bring that up and say well actually are you going to provide this because this is what I need and I need that in writing so there's a way to sort of combat it it doesn't mean completely cut them off obviously if they give you a horrible review then you might not want to work with them um, but that is up to you and your own sort of ethics and the way that you want to work with them.